But we also have the, the seating communities uh, mm -hmm. vision resonating together. That's something that's been in my heart for years. I lived in community in the, uh, when I was in my early 20s for five years. And uh, began to, during the time I was living there, get a sense of what was possible down the road. Then actually received uh, a full-on vision with, with technicolor imagery and feeling and words. And I wrote it down and, and thought, well, this is, this is going to happen soon. But that was in 1978. So sometimes these visions take a while to incubate. You were in your 20s? Yeah. yeah. And it, it was the sense of a, a community that was not only based upon spiritual principles, uh, where people were living very consciously in alignment with God and committed to their awakening process, but that the community was serving as a template for other communities as well as offering a venue for people to come for a, a deep passage, an awakening passage. And in the vision, I, I saw it symbolically as um, the old ground was falling away. There was fire and um, a letting go of the old structures. And the new community was on higher ground, very high, clear energy to it. And people were, were climbing towards it uh, to find safe harbor, but also to uh, go through an intensive process to help them quicken, enlighten, and open their mind to the higher, higher frequencies. And that this community would serve people's awakening and offer this deep kind of passage experience. And that there would be many of them dotted all over the planet. And I, you know, I thought it was going to happen, you know, that year. You know, I kept looking for it and nothing, nothing. And eventually I just let it go. And a few years ago in Santa Barbara, I just was feeling it so strongly again. And we called together a, a community visioning time. And I realized at the end of that, we, we met for about um, once a week for a month and shared, because... Uh, I don't know about you, but I, the people in the Santa Barbara community, many of them hold a flame in their heart about this. They have the sense of what's possible when you uh, let go of an isolated life and truly join with others. But what I found was um, we just couldn't come into alignment, not everyone, with what the purpose would be for the community. And I realized that the purpose that rang true for me was was kind of a rarefied one. Uh, I wanted it to be people living the principles of A Course in Miracles with that profound sense of accountability for what arises in their own awareness and um, that if it's projected out onto others that they are able to bring it back and, and work with it and, and express honestly. Um, but it was valuable to just get it up and get it speaking. So uh, when I met David, and I think it was in uh, Novato, and that was the first time that you said, you know, we're thinking about really allowing some time to drop in a deep community. Uh, there's been so much travel for so many years, and it seems the season now uh, to come together and allow uh, a community to form uh, around these teachings. And then uh, then you put the word out a little later, and I, I sent my email with my, my whole vision of the... Because I'd, I'd received this image of the central meeting room and common room, and then in concentric circles going out, offices, recording studios, living quarters, and... Uh, and, and kind of an energetic mandala where the, where the structures all flow into the meeting ground in the common zone of the community. So when I went to uh, the monastery for the first time in August and stepped out and looked around and felt it, I almost, you know, well, a little later on, 
when I was over at the um, that little bandana ranch house, I did have a meltdown of joy. You know, <laughs> since 1978, you know, to be carrying this vision in my heart and oftentimes forgetting it, and then it would come back, and the thing would never go away. This deep, deep call, and to be standing in the actual location with the actual people with that exact intention that I had, and here it was. I, I, you know, yeah, it was a little overloading that first day. <laughs> I'm just kind of walking around going, oh my God, it's real. So what we're feeling is this, this possibility of seeding communities, these, these various uh, nodes all over the planet of people who realize how profoundly important it is to have mighty companions and join in this committed configuration of uh, no people pleasing, no private thoughts, and living a lifestyle that is without the distractions and dedicated to the awakening and supporting each other in that. And this feeling that some of the travel coming up will be more intentional along those lines of um, Yes, going and doing intensives and, and things of that nature, but especially where there's been an invitation from a cluster of people who are feeling this, this calling to come together in, in one form or another. That's and a calling for myself and Noel and definitely for all the messengers. We, we go where there's a strong invitation. We aren't trying to go around and, and plant seedlings uh, everywhere we go, even though we're just shining and shining, we know that, that it's a very deep, devoted path and you have to really, you know, having mighty companions around you just allows you the witnesses of showing that your trust is justified. It's not a blind faith or a blind trust, you actually see the reflections coming right back to you and then it grows stronger and stronger. And um, uh, there was a point in uh, Australia where I think Lisa and Kirsten were drawing on these papers, these clusters, and calling them pods. Uh, there's a pod here and then a pod there, a pod will start here and there. It's very similar to your vision. It was They were just so excited and, you know, Jason and I and Helena and Jenny, we were like, what's going on? And they were like, oh, paper, more paper, get some more paper. They were drawing out more and more pods and, and describing this kind of how they saw it unfolding. And I think for my travels, people have been inspired, like in Belgium, Ulrich and Rainer uh, purchased the property next door. They, they call their house a peace house. Like originally the house where I kind of started off uh, back in 1996, before the travels kind of started up again. Uh, I called it the peace house. There's like, in Sovalden, that's where I met Mahani. Uh, they cleared some land, they erected this big tent, and we went there in southern Sweden, near her, and we rejoiced, and people came from all over, and I remember afterwards, uh, Bahani coming to me, and he said, I felt so comfortable, I felt not judged by all these people. It was a beautiful experience to have so many people there from all around and you felt just loved and accepted and not judged. And so that was another attempt at a, at a peace house in southern Sweden. It went on for a few years. And we've had little uh, places calling them peace houses. Uh, not always trying to live completely by the principles that I was sharing, but taking a stab at it, you know. Like the general sentiment was like, I'm going to call it a peace house, and to the best of our abilities, we'll, we'll try to uh, have a peaceful house and really extend peace. But the teachings go so deep, and I know that among the messengers, we've, we've just gone deeper and deeper with it. And there's been a little community that sprung up around us in Cincinnati that we quickly kind of outgrew. And now the monastery is there, and it's like a little village out in high desert. In a, uh, in a canyon, right by a canyon. And now in Australia there's a, a little core group there that's really moving along that Kirsten just uh, been working with and came from. And I also had a, a great interest in intentional communities. I, I would 
for years look through literature. I would actually go around and visit communities. I lived in spiritual communities, uh, I think starting around the mid-1990s was my first intentional community. It started off a little bit around Cincinnati where I was, then it went up to Michigan, then we had another one out in, uh, in uh, Denver. And wow, the, the issues and the emotions and things get triggered so much faster in spiritual community. It's almost like the ego is really out of its comfort zone. It likes its own space, its own food, its own refrigerator, you know, its own little closets for its clothes and it's like its own silverware, you know, and its own space. In fact, even in relationships, you know, as the relationships progress, you'll often hear the words come out, give me space, or I need my space. But with spiritual community, it's, it's intensified. It's really intensified. It's a, it's a way of flushing the ego up. And without a really core principle, guiding principle, that is really internalized and practiced, then it's pretty wild. I think most communities, uh, what was the research on it? How many communities fail? High 80%. Up in the upper 80% of all communities fail and disband. So it's, you know, there's a rare percentage that continue on. And then of those ones that continue on, probably the world would identify some very kind of cultish, uh, to use the words, bizarre things that happen in the percentage that do continue on. There's a bit of superior, inferior, there's control mechanisms, there's hiding, there's secrets, and so on and so forth that are typical in most families, of course, so it's not like there are really any cults out so there. So, out of that maybe 11-12% that do succeed, you know, it's still like the ego can really have its way and it becomes more like a ritual, more like belonging to a club. It's got the kind of smacks of like a little bit of elitism, you know, like a we they. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta, you gotta do all these things to become members and you know, it's, it's like there's a pretty strong line between who's in and who's out. They, those kind of communities aren't really interested in vi just vibrating and sharing this, radiating this love of experience of universal love, that really we're all connected, really there are no boundaries at all. And so that's been uh, something of, of mine that I really hoped would, would come in. And I felt like, with all my experiences, that it would only come in in the Holy Spirit's timing, so to speak. It would just be given, like everything else in my life, had just come when when I was ready, uh, it appeared. If you do the inner work and clear the altar of your heart, then the reflection will show up. And I actually felt like the whole world and the whole universe is my community, so I don't really draw any boundaries. It doesn't matter whether I'm stopping off at a laundromat or a rest area or traveling and meeting people on the streets. It's to me that's all community now. But in terms of mind training, you can see how valuable this has been over these, like we're going on five weeks now. There's a sense of confidence and trust and relaxed feeling that comes in when you start to be able to share openly and have everyone share from their heart and without a sense of judgment. Then you gain more of a confidence like, I'm going to do that more and more and more and more. And then you start to feel this open-hearted gift uh, coming in. So the call now for me is not so much to just go to so many countries and so many stops along the way, but it's just really to answer the call for this deeper community. So that's really I think what we're feeling when we talk about seeding communities, that there's a core of people that come together, uh, generally in a location. I mean if it, if it was sprinkled all over and, and people are still sprinkled and there's not a, a little bit of a cohesiveness, then it's just like, well, that's just still ripe, uh, fertile ground for a community, but it actually has to kind of come together a bit, uh, have a little bit of cohesiveness to really have a call that I think I or we or any of us feel real called to. So that's one thing that I think will, will pretty much guide us in our travels as we come into next year.